So choosing a type of business entity. You know, people walk into our, my office and, and we see our role um, uh, not so much as providing here's the legal thing you need, but here's the answer you need to help you organize your business. You know, so how do you, one of the first things is, how do I organize my business? You know, what, what, what kind of form should it be in? Well, there's a couple of things to think about. Your first off is what's your business plan look like? You know, do you have an ability to generate cash quickly in the near term? Do you have an ability to be profitable in the near term? You know, what's the potential for rapid growth of the, the business? What's the market size that you think you can grow to? I just sort of arbitrarily put $100 million up there, but it has to be you know, large enough that it's uh, uh, going to be attractive to uh, investors if you want to get investors. Um, and then what are your needs? Do you need business advice? Do you need connections? Do you need experience? Uh, and all, or are you able to do this uh, yourself? There are also questions as to investors. What kind of investors do you want to bring in? Do you want to bring in institutional in investors? Um, do you need to bring in institutional investors? You know, there are various ways of raising capital, um, but the deepest source with the fewest, um, well, you know, it, it, it's, I was going to say the fewest strings, um, but uh, it, or is venture capital, but it's, it's sort of a binary uh, thing. Either you perform, or you don't perform. You know, it's that simple with a venture capitalist. We bring in money from other sources, it you know, tends to have um, more hair on it or more uh, issues. Um, there's also the question of structure. You know, are there structural things that are important to you? You know, first off, one of the largest reasons for uh, picking a, business, a particular type of business entity as opposed to just operating as a sole proprietorship is to get the shield from liability. You know, the first thing that, uh, you know, when somebody says to me, you know, well, when should we incorporate? When should we set up the entity? It's like, before you sign any contract that commits you to do anything, make sure you have an entity there that is on the hook rather than you and your house and your car and your retirement. Make sure it's the entity that's on the hook. Get that shield of liability there. It's one of the most important things. Okay, maybe you can sign an NDA. But anything beyond that, it says we're going to develop this. We're going to pay for this lease. Anything like that. Set up the entity. Get that shield of liability. Also, the notion the Silicon Valley is based on, we'll talk about this some more, the notion of selling high at a high price to investors and low to employees. You need to build a structure that allows you to do that. Some entities allow you to, some don't. Do you want to even give equity to your employees? You know, there's a whole bunch of issues that come up there. It's very much the Silicon Valley way, but you need to have a structure that, that uh, satisfies that. On the other hand, sometimes you need to have customizable interests. You want to have very, uh, you, want, you have 10 people involved and you want to have 10 different uh, ways of dealing with their, uh, their ownership interests in the company or their interests in the profits of the, uh, the business. Uh, do you need to have that in, the, in this case? And then two of the other factors that, uh, um, that come up um, are um, um, in versus some entities is do you, you, do you want the, enti the, uh, the business to have an unlimited life? Uh, is it based upon particular individu individuals and their participation and roles or is it somewhat separate, is it larger than that? Can it go on beyond them? And how much control do you want as a founder? You know, this is a really crucial thing. Um, when you bring in certain types of investors, especially you know, venture capitalists, you are hiring your boss. You, know, you are becoming an employee. Uh, you are turning over your idea to the corporation and you are losing a lot of control on that. Now, Ultimately, if you're successful, you know, really successful, and you go through a public offering, at that point your investors sell off their stock, they distribute out all their interests, and you're probably left as the, one of the major shareholders at that point, and you get some of the control back, at least vis-a-vis -vis your investors. 
Um, but there's a big trade-off there in allowing the uh, investors in. So based on all those factors, that's what I go through when I talk to uh, someone who comes into my office and says, well, I want to set up a business and, uh, and uh, how should I do it? And I'll ask all those questions. There are generally five different types of entities that, um, that you can organize a business as, as a, at least an operating business. I've left off some of the more obscure ones like for law firms and for venture capital funds and things like that. But for an operating business, the, uh, there's basically these five. Um, the first two, um, sole proprietorship and general partnership, are basically what happens when you don't do anything. When you don't come to see a lawyer, you just start operations. It's either you by yourself running the business or it's a couple of you getting together and and agreeing informally that you have joint ownership. Very simple. You don't have to pay lawyers. Always a good thing. You know, downsides of that are there's no limitation of liability. There's no liability shield there. And it's tied to the particular individuals. Remember I talked about unlimited life? Well, what happens when you pass away or one of your partners passes away? And it's hard to raise capital and it's hard to compensate your employees. So generally people don't use these forms for emerging growth businesses. So we're going to move right on. People talk about LLCs. It used to be, you know, 10 or so years ago when, our, uh, when the um, LLC statutes were adopted in a lot of states, we got a lot of questions. I hear this is really great thing. This is wonderful. Uh, you know, can we set it up as an LLC? Um, and LLC is a limited liability company. Um, and it has the advantages of a single level of taxation. You know, they, it is a tax, um, uh, basically you do not look, um, the entity does not pay tax. The members of the LLC, they're called members rather than shareholders, they pay the tax um, themselves and that's the only level. You know, the profits and losses of the LLC are allocated out to the share, um, sorry, members and the members pay the tax at that level much more efficient than having two levels of taxation. Sounds great. Um, also, there's an infinite flexibility in how you can structure interests. Remember a minute ago I said, do you need customizable interests um, because you have 10 different people with 10 different ways you want them to own the uh, business and share in the profits? LLC is wonderful for that. It's, it's, a, it's a really powerful entity that way. However, Infinite flexibility also requires custom drafting and analysis and a lot of payments to me as the lawyer. Um, that's a bad thing. Generally, it costs about three times the uh, amount of money to do anything with an LLC that, that um, you would do with a corporation. In addition, this is always the killer. You know, people say, oh, I want an LLC. This is really great. And I say, okay, you understand how to do um, how capital accounts work and, uh, and uh, how to do the accounting for all that? And they sort of look at me and it's like, Huh? What's a capital account and everything like that? Um, and as Doug said, you know, I've got a degree in physics. I don't know how many semesters of college calculus I have, everything like that. I cannot figure out how you work with capital accounts in a, in a, in a partnership or an LLC. You know, booking it up and all that stuff, maybe you guys can teach me at some point, but it's, it's a mess, you know, at least as, you know, for simple people like me. Um, uh, there's a lot of complexity there about your accounting and how you divide up, you know, voting control, how you divide up who gets the profits, how you divide up who gets the allocations for tax purposes of the profits, how you divide up um, distributions of income, how you divide up the distributions of assets if you sell the company. Um, you got you to gotta write all those rules yourself or you got to pay me to write all those rules yourself. And do you want to spend, think of my title for this whole thing, do you want to be creative in your capital structure or do you want to be creative in your technology? So there are certain businesses that this is perfect for. There are certain situations this is perfect for. Generally, starting an emerging growth company, you know, the typical one in Silicon Valley, is not one of those businesses that works with the LLC. In addition, VCs won't invest in them because of the, the way the tax uh, um, 
uh, code works um, and you, because the members are taxed, that means the VC funds are going to be taxed to the extent they have offshore investors or the extent they have nonprofit investors. All of them are going to be taxed and have, um, what is it, UBTI, un unrelated business uh, uh, tax income, I think, um, which will be a very bad thing. So you will not get any venture capitalists to invest in an LLC. And employees will not be very interesting. You know, this, this is the golf course phenomenon. And uh, you, know, you get a bunch of engineers down around the, uh, the, uh, the fourth tee down at Shoreline um, playing. And you know, one of them says, you know, well, <coughs> I've got options for 100,000. I got 100,000 options at my company. You know, and another one says, <laughs> I got 200,000 options. And another one says, I got 500,000 options. <laughs> Did they talk at all about how big the company is, how good the company is, or anything like that? No. I mean, that's how they measure themselves. But then there's the fourth guy in the group, and he says, well, you know, I've got a contingent right to acquire a, a, uh, a Class B membership interest in an LLC, and everyone sort of looks at him and goes, huh? And wah, 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 wah. So you think this is a joke. This is the biggest reason why some of the LLCs that we've set up have not worked. We set up one for, um, uh, for Netscape uh, about 10, 15 years ago and uh, told them the golf course, the, the golf course problem, and they said, oh, that doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. A year later, they came back and said, we can't hire employees. We can't motivate them because they don't get traditional Silicon Valley options. So anyway, enough on the LLC. You know, works great someplace, but not here. There's also a, an entity called an S corporation under uh, subchapter S of the tax code. Um, it's a very simple structure. It's a corporation. You don't have to write any of your rules. You've got all the corporation um, rules written for you. That's the real advantage of, of setting up a corporation. You've got rules there already. You can pull the structure off of the shelf. You don't have to create it. Um, but you also get a single level of taxation. It's not quite as good as the LLC. It's not exactly this, not completely a single level, but uh, generally it's, uh, it's got a, a flow through type accounting. Downside is you can't have institutional investors. You can only have individuals and some types of estate planning trusts as shareholders. So not only no VCs, but no, nothing that's an entity. The employees can get options. You can do an option plan, but they're also going to get K-1s um, if they exercise their options, if they're shareholders, and they're going to say, what are these, these things I'm getting? And I get an allocation of $5 of income that I have to report, and I have to pay an accountant to interpret this. Um, not a good situation. And you can only have one class of stock, and this is a key factor we're going to get into in a minute, of, of the ability to have as I said earlier, to sell high to investors and sell low to employees. Um, you can't do that here because the S corporation can only have common stock. So useful occasionally. Useful if you have a business where you don't need to bring in institutional money. By the way, some of the most um, successful companies and the ones that I respect the most, emerging growth companies, um, have been S corporations. Word perfect. You know, that was an S corporation right till the moment that they sold it to Novell. Uh, and uh, uh, Hercules Graphics Board, Princeton Monitors. You know, these were companies that figured out how to fund themselves without bringing in outside money. And, and if you can do that, you can maintain all the control. You, you don't, you don't uh, become an employee of the venture capitalist by, uh, by bringing them in. Um, that's the ultimate, but it's very hard to do. The fact that you know, there are only a couple that I can mention shows you how hard it is. Uh, oops, wrong one. How do I get, get rid of that? So, that one. so we're left with the bottom one, the C corporation. This is what almost all emerging growth companies are set up as. It's a reasonably simple structure. They said with well-known, well-defined rules. You don't have to spend any time explaining people. When you get onto an elevator with the, an investor that you want to bring in, you don't have to spend any time explaining your capital structure. You can spend that ride talking about your business and your idea. That's, that's what you really want. And you can 
you grant the uh, traditional options. People, can, you know, your engineers can actually brag on the golf course about how many options they have. You do have double taxation, though. The, the corporation is taxed at its level. Um, maybe um, if you're lucky, you can um, use those uh, losses that you generate in the earlier years later on, but don't bet on it because there's tax rules about how much you can, um, how much uh, your net operating losses can be carried forward to future years. Um, and it's relatively inflexible, but we're going to assume you don't need flexibility. So. That's the choice of entities. And you can see I've driven it down to the C corporation for the venture-backed company model. And what are the characteristics of a venture-backed company? It needs large amounts of capital, amounts that can only come from institutional investors. If you don't need that capital, try, try the S corporation route, maybe even try the LLC route, if you can keep it simple. You need to have a uh, potential for rapid growth with large target market. If you're going to bring in venture capitalists, they're going to want to know that your business is going to be able to grow large enough to give them a return that's large enough that it's going to move the needle from them, for them. If they have a billion dollar fund and you come to them and you say, look, I've got this tremendous business. You know, we're going to generate $25 million in revenue when we get to be really big and our profit margin is going to be 50%. You know, where can you get that? Anywhere else. Look at that profit margin. It's like they don't care. It doesn't move the needle for them. You know, so you need to be able to say this, is a, this, is going to, this business is going to grow to the extent that you're going to be able to put enough money at work, 10, 20, 30 million dollars of investment from each of your major investors you know, and then have that grow to the point that it will return a major amount that will change the economics of their, uh, or affect the economics of their fund. So some businesses don't fit that at all. You know, they, and they can be tremendously profitable and tremendously um, lucrative for the founders, uh, if you can do it, uh, but they don't fit the model. Uh, another characteristic, obviously, I keep talking about it, employees are compensated through equity. One of the basic things of Silicon Valley. You know, it is realistic that for employees to think that they may make the big hit because somebody down the street from them actually did. Some friend of theirs actually did. You also need uh, contributions of others. You can't, it's, it's uh, I know a characteristic of these companies is you can't do it all by yourself. You don't have all the connections. You don't. You may be a tremendous um, uh, engineer, but you don't know anything about how do you organize the financials or the, just the administrative aspects of the business. You need to bring others in to do that. And you don't have any need for any custom or tax advantage structures. You don't have somebody sitting there saying, well, I really do want to get the tax losses and use those in the early years. Um, and then Talked about this a little earlier. You want to sell low to investors, and, uh, low to employees, and high to investors. So that leads us to I talked about this a little earlier. A dual class um, stock structure, and, I, and I've labeled it as the, the foundation of Silicon Valley. This notion of selling differently to the two different uh, groups. And um, you know, the question is, you know, how. Uh, how can you justify that? You know, generally, the tax people will say, well, if you're selling the same thing to two different um, people at the same time, somebody must be getting a discount, and we're going, to, we're going to tax the person who's getting the discount because you know, they must be getting it as compensation for services because that's the way the tax uh, people get the most money, by characterizing it that way. So you try to justify, you know, Differences in price to different people by lapse of time, you know, by achievements and milestones during this period. When we sold you the founder stock at a tenth of a cent a share, the stock, uh, the company really wasn't much more than a napkin, a drawing on a napkin. But now we've got a beta, we've got all this interest from customers. We've even like got some demos out there, you know, people, uh, um, you know, trying it and giving us a little bit of, uh, of money for it. 
Um, so it's appropriate that the valuation is a lot higher, and therefore when we bring the investors in, we can charge them more for the stock. Oops, I went back too far. So, but really the thing is you sell them something different. You sell preferred stock to the investors, and you sell common stock to the employees. Now, when I was in law school, when we read cases about preferred stock, they were all about how the company and the common stockholders can completely abuse the preferred stockholders and, and wipe them out. And I kept thinking, why would anybody buy preferred stock? I mean, this just doesn't, you know, doesn't matter because uh, it's a bad investment because the common, which controls the company, a big company, uh, like public company that issues preferred stock, can, you know, basically hold the preferred hostage, you know, and put the company in bankruptcy if, if, uh, if the preferred doesn't compromise. Well, the crucial difference here is the common doesn't control the company here. The preferred controls it in a venture-backed company. Um, and in addition, it's really kind of the same stuff. You know, yeah, there are some preferences that make the preferred, give the preferred its name and justify a difference in price, but m a lot of them are there just to justify the difference in price um, and some to give the, the investor some control. But it's not the type of preferred stock that you'd see a company like GM issue at all, which has sort of real dividends and, and, and real separate rights. So what does the venture capital back company look like? It, this is, this is the, the summary of what I've been saying earlier. It's a C corporation. It's, uh, it's got preferred stock um, for the investors. It's got common stock for the founders. It's got options for the employees. Typical terms of the preferred stock, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. This is sort of legal, a lot of legal stuff, but just to give you a flavor of this, because I want to jump through these terms and then get to how should you think about these things. But, um, well, let me step aside. What's the three most important things in, uh, in, uh, um, uh, in real estate? Okay, so what's the three most important things in a venture capital financing deal and an in, in arrangement for you bring in the venture capitalists? Valuation, valuation, valuation. That's what you want to know. You want to know what the valuation is. The distant fourth is how do you divide up the pie, you know, when the company is acquired. And that's what is called liquidation preference. And this is the first and most important term of the preferred stock that venture capitalists get. Um, they get their money back first, almost always. And sometimes they get to share in what's left over after they get their money back. They also get veto powers over certain corporate actions or certain structural actions, mergers, liquidations, issuing, uh, creating new series that might be uh, superior to them or maybe not. You know, they have a bunch of things that tie up what the company can do from a structural point of view. Hopefully not too much what it can do from a business point of view, but sometimes you see limitations on how much debt you can take on and, and what kind of large transactions you can enter into. Otherwise than that, the preferred votes along with the common. They really like common stock, except for these special preferences. There's a whole mathematical study of anti-dilution and how that works, but all we'll say right now is basically the preferred stockholders get some protection for if, the, if investors come in at a later time and buy at a lower price, right? A price, uh, new investors come in at a price below what I pay as the original investor, then I get some sort of adjustment in my price. And it's handled through some complex <laughs> math. Um, <coughs> but uh, there's that protection there too. A couple uh, other points. The preferred is convertible into common stock at any time. It starts at a one-to-one -one basis, but, there, but it can be adjusted. That's how this anti-dilution protection generally works, through adjustments in the conversion rate. Um, and then it automatically converts into common on the IPO. The notion is that the value of, the, um, of a lot of these preferences is, um, is um, applies when the company is still private. Once the company is public, 
you don't need these protections uh, for the preferred stockholders anymore. Um, they can, the company is a reasonable success since it's been able to go public and they can sell out or distribute their uh, investments, uh, distribute their stock to their, uh, uh, their investors. Um, so um, the preferred stock's not, le not needed at that point. The value of the preferred and the common converge and all the preferred converts into common or IPO. In addition, I don't think you get an underwriter that would take a company public and sell common stock out to the public if it still had an overhang of preferred stock sitting in the top of it. And there are also various contractual rights. You know, the preferred stockholders get the rights to financial statements at various times. They can come in and inspect the, the company. They, can, they have a right to buy in future financings. They um, uh, may be able to participate and sell along with the company in public offerings. Um, and uh, they also have an ability, if, usually if the founders want to sell some of their stock, the investors have an ability to say, well, if that's a really good deal, I want to be able to sell some of my stock too. To sell, it's called a right of co-sale, sell along with the founders. And if the founder is selling at a really low price, the investor says, well, I want to step in and buy it myself. I don't want some outsider to get the benefit of the low price. So they get a right of first refusal to buy from the founder. So it's a way of just tying up the founders so the founders can't get liquidity uh, before the investors. I've got entire lectures that go on both on those last two slides um, for lawyers, but I'm not going to bore you with uh, all of those details um, now. But I will give you a way of kind of thinking about some of this stuff. You know, the basic themes under all of this, you know, I've put into three categories. One is dividing the pie, and this comes back to my point about valuation, valuation, valuation. You know, how do you, uh, uh, how is the uh, um, uh, how are the benefits of the company um, you know, divided among people? Second is control. You know, we, I talked about um, a number of these things where the preferred gets veto powers. Um, uh, and then the final is how does this all play out in exits? You know, what happens in upside scenarios? What happens in downside scenarios? So in dividing the pie, it's very simple math. How much money are you raising? How much uh, is the company valued uh, right, uh, right now before the money comes in? And that tells you the percentage ownership that the investors are going to get. You know, generally, they're going to, at least in the first round, they're going to want to get about 50%. They're going to want to get control or pretty close to it in terms of, of voting power. How do you come up with a valuation, though? This is the number one question that we get, you know, when, when people come in our office. Well, here's my business plan. Isn't it great? What do you think? Well, you know, I'm about to go get investors. What's my valuation? It's like, you know, if I could come up with your valuation, I don't think I'd be a lawyer. I think I'd be much more uh, successful uh, in doing other things. It's a black art, you know, and I can also go in with a lot of, I think I'll leave that to some of the other uh, participants in, uh, in our lecture series to talk about valuations. Um, uh, I have very skeptical views as to any of the math that goes on behind coming up with valuations. Um, but a couple things to be very careful about when you talk about valuations. First off is there's a talk about pre-money and post-money, which seems pretty obvious, but people get confused by it. Pre-money is what's the value of the company before the investment comes in. Post is after it comes in. Post equals pre-money plus amount invested. Pretty simple, huh? But make sure when you're talking to an investor that you're, talking, you're both talking about either pre-money or you're both talking about post-money. Second point is fully diluted. Let's assume the VCs come in and they say, I want to get 50% control of the company. You know, and you think, well, that's great. I'm the founder. I'm going to have the remainder, you know, 50%. Well, no. You know, they're also going to want you to, to allocate some shares for people that, sh that you know you're going to need to bring in, other members of the management team, and other employees. Um, generally, about a 20% um, allocation, um, either in terms of stock or an option plan. So, um, and th but those shares are not going to be outstanding right now. 
if you actually divided the pie the day after the closing of the venture capital financing, nobody would get anything because of that, the, that allocation uh, there on the actual outstanding, the actual ownership basis. Um, but because the VCs know that you're probably going to need to issue those shares, and because if you wait and you price the deal based um, without taking into that those extra shares, um, if you did that, then the VCs would be diluted by those future future share issuances, um, and they don't want that. They want you as the founder to shepherd all the dilution by this. We'll get into some of this in a minute. That's why I've included a lot of these charts and. Um, and, um, and tables for you to show you an example of this. But be very careful. They're going to talk about fully diluted, which includes every option that's outstanding already and uh, ignoring any vesting that's in any shares and um, a reserve for future option grants too. And then determining how much to raise, um, that's a whole large area too. It gets out of law and into, into finance. But think about dilution that you're going to take. The more money you raise, the more dilution you're going to take in terms of your ownership, the more control you're going to give up versus risk mitigation. You know, having 10% of a business that actually succeeds is worth a lot more than having 50% of a business that doesn't get anywhere. Um, and the, uh, the number of times that Somebody has come in and uh, into our offices and said, you know, gosh, I really wish I hadn't taken all that investment. It's completely outweighed by the number of times that people have, you know, kicked themselves for not taking more, which leads to another, you know, number one thing that we say to investors when they say, gosh, somebody's willing to put in money, but I'm really worried about the dilution. You know, three words, take the money. You know. If money is offered to you, take it. You will always need that money. You will always run short of it later on, regardless of what you think. And you do want to raise enough that you can get to the next, um, uh, to a milestone so that you can raise money the next time at a higher valuation. There's also the concepts of control. You know, there are a whole bunch of control mechanisms that are built into uh, these preferred stock terms. The preferred stockholders are going to get representations on the board. They're probably going to get a majority of the board. Even those who don't sit as directors are going to want to sit in and watch the board meeting. And that's where they're going to exercise most of the control. Every month when you have a board meeting, you are performing for your bosses. You know, and you know, I attend a lot of board meetings and, and you know, until I got used to it, it always surprised me how nervous the management team was. and. And, uh, and how stressed they were. But you are performing you know, every month for the venture capitalists who are in your board. And it applies not just to the CEO, but the CFO and all the other officers. And you know, by now, you know, I can watch somebody perform in a board meeting. It doesn't happen a lot, but you know, something will happen. It's like, we'll see if that officer's around at the next board meeting. You know, oh, they just asked the CFO, you know, what's our cash position and when do we run out? If you can't answer that question immediately, there's 50% chance you're not going to be the CEO at the next board meeting. I've seen it happen over and over. So there's direct control and then there's, uh, there's this um, uh, you know, indirect control that you have when the VCs are on your board. Uh, we talked about some voting rights and voting powers in order for the company to do certain things. You're going to have to get separate votes of your preferred stockholders. Yesterday, one of my clients calls up and says, you know, we want to add this person to the board. Everybody likes him. Everybody's agreed to it. Do I have to do anything other than just we'll agree to it at the board meeting? Well, yes, because when you negotiate this deal with the venture capital investors, it says in this contract you got to get their approval to increase the size of the board. And we got to do all this extra stuff and you got to pay me money to do to do the documents to do that. I think it's dumb, but the investors wanted it. They wanted that extra set of restraints upon you. And some of these apply to um, a lot of different types of situations. As I said, mergers, uh, issuing senior securities, um, Sometimes it gets into what I think are burdensome things where 
you have to get shareholder votes in order to, you know, borrow money, you know, in order to borrow more than a million dollars or something like that. You know, it just is slowing things down. But a lot of venture capitalists want that. Final point on how to think about this is, uh, or think about VC deals, or what happens on exits. There's upside exits, IPOs, or acquisitions where everybody's getting a lot of money, and the preferred and the common are basically the same at that point. They are the same in an IPO. Um, the return that they get in an upside acquisition may not be that much different. Um, and so what really matters there um, is what's the percentage ownership, that the preferred have versus the common, which all comes back to what was the valuation negotiation that you had at the very beginning. On the downside, we come to the, the liquidation preference. The downside is either an acquisition or a winding up of the company. Um, and then what matters is the liquidation preference of the preferred, because they're going to get their money back first. And if there isn't enough money, uh, from the acquisition or the, the shutting down of the company, they're going to get all of it. So you can see the two elements of negotiation in a venture financing, you know, valuation for how is it going to, how's it going to work out, how the proceeds going to divide it on the upside, and um, liquidation preference on the downside. Let's do, um, let's see, Doug, we want, I, I want to go to what, quarter of or something like that, and then last some time for... Okay, so employee equity, just to do this really quickly. Um, uh, generally, people grant options. There's a bunch of different types of equity that you can use, but it's usually either ISOs, incentive stock options, NSOs, non-statutories or non-qualified, basically anything that's not an ISO, and restricted stock. How does... The difference between opt ISOs and NSOs is how they're taxed. And um, one way to think of it is, you know, what's start, you start with the point of view is how is a non-ISO, how is an NSO taxed? You know, when the option's granted, there's no tax. You know, you're granted an option to buy 1,000 shares at 50 cents a share, which is the current firm market value. In theory, there's no value there at all because you're buying something at current value. Um, there's no tax to the uh, employee um, at all. Once you exercise the option, so let's say the value has gone up from 50 cents, now it's a dollar. So there's 50 cents of gain there. When that option is exercised, the IRS will say, well, that gain is, prof is uh, income to you. So we're going to tax you at ordinary income rates on that spread. The difference between fair market value, the time of exercise, and the exercise price. That's ordinary income at that time. It's subject to withholding and payroll taxes, so you can't get around it. Uh, the company's going to have to keep the money um, uh, out of your paycheck. And then when you sell the shares, um, there's a, the tax, which is capital gains, which may or may not be long term, based on how long you held the shares, on the difference between your sale price and the um, fair market value at the time of the um, of your exercise. You can think of where well, you paid tax up to the fair market value at the time of exercise in ordinary income, and then the amount above that is capital gains, which can be either long term or short term. The advantage of doing an ISO is there's also no tax upon grant, but there's also no tax at the time of exercise. You know, the tax code says we're going to allow you that, that, that difference between fair market value at the uh, time of exercise and, um, and your exercise price, we're going to allow you not to pay ordinary income tax on that at that time. Um, although note that you can still have to pay AMT on that. It's an item of of uh, AMT preference, and a lot of people got nailed in that in the, in, uh, the um, uh, internet bubble. Um, but there's also no withholding and no payroll taxes. That's 7% right there for FICA and Social Security and things like that that you save. Then when you sell the shares, the entire spread between your sale price and your exercise price is taxed at that time, uh, and if you've held the shares for long enough, then 
that's all taxed at capital gains rates, long-term capital gains rates. So you've converted, you've got a couple of advantages there. You've delayed the time of taxation. You've uh, converted that amount between fair market value at time of exercise and exercise price. You've converted that to um, capital gains, long-term capital gains. And number three, you're also getting, uh, having to pay the tax at a time when you actually have cash because you sold the shares and you got money in. It doesn't have to be um, you know, withheld out of your paycheck. Really quickly, you know, to grant ISOs, you have to have an ISO plan that complies with the tax code. Stockholders have to approve it. Uh, it's available for employees only, and there's special rules for 10% stockholders. But the big thing is what I said a minute ago, um, the, um, uh, in, in, um, you have to hold the shares for long enough. You have to hold the shares for two years from the date you got the option and one year from the date you exercise. And pretty much nobody is going to do that unless the, at time of exercise, um, the exercise price is so small that it doesn't really matter. Founders might do this at the beginning of a company or very early on at the company. But to exercise your options at a, where you have to actually come out tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars for your exercise price and sit on that investment for a year, um, even if the company is public, you know, so you have some idea that you might be able to get out into a public market at the end of the year. It's really risky, taking market risk for a, a, um, uh, for a whole year. And if the company's private, you know, who knows where the company will be in a year. So it seems very attractive. Most options are, are ISOs, um, but very few people take advantage of them. Let's also talk about restricted stock a little. Restricted stock is the mirror of of an option. An option is a right to acquire shares at a fixed price and I can choose the point in time when I want to acquire those shares. Yeah. And, um, and there's vesting usually in Silicon Valley uh, companies tied to that option so that initially I can't exercise at all. You know, we see the graph here that shows um, for one year, for 12 months, you know, I cannot exercise my option at all here. Uh, and then after 12 months, I can buy 25%, one quarter. And then on a monthly basis thereafter, I can buy more and more till after the end of four years, I can buy the entire 100% uh, of the shares subject to the option. So that's how vesting works. If I leave, you know, during this first year, I get nothing. I can't exercise the option at all. If I leave halfway in, I can, I can get, after 24 months, I can exercise the option for 50%. You can do the same thing with restricted stock, where you buy the stock all at the beginning, but the company has a right to buy back your shares that exactly mirrors this situation. So the company has a right to buy back 100% of your stock for the first year. And then at the end of the first year, can buy back 50 percent, uh, I'm sorry, buy back 75 percent, uh, and then that progressively declines over, over time. Yeah, the question over here. Or question? Uh, yeah, uh, when it comes to the ISO requirements that your shares be paid down, is that, is that include vesting in the, so that paid down? It ignores vesting. It ignores vesting. Okay. Yes. Sure. Yes, sir. Oh, that's, that's true. And, and, and actually, let me get through and we'll come back to the questions just to, on, on, on time, if I can. Um, the, the one question there was um, on the ISO requirements and the two-year um, holding period requirement from date of grant, does that, um, is that after the shares vest? And the answer is no. Um, vesting is ignored for purposes of, of um, meeting that holding period requirement. So, um, so anyway, is that, is, that, is that clear, the, the two sides of the same issue here? So, isn't that neat the way I got to do that? Huh? Um, and, uh, and so the question is, you know, the benefit, you, you hold the stock, so you can vote the stock um, from the outset, but you're also bearing investment risk for that whole time. One more legal topic. All securities laws in three slides. So we're only going to talk about what really matters here. Basically, all securities laws can be boiled down into two things. One is that every sale of a security 
in the United States has to be approved by both the federal and the state governments or it has to come under an exemption. This isn't using the lawyer's terms at all, but this is sort of the translation. Every sale. Second rule is any omission or misstatement of a material fact in connection with the purchase or sale of a security is a violation of the law. So that's all of securities laws in one slide. I'll give you two more to explain those two and why I bring them up for you at all and how they affect you. One is, well, let's talk first about the, the, uh, the uh, approval requirement of the federal government. What does this mean? It means uh, you want to avoid getting the approval of the federal state government and you want to come under an exemption. And the exemption is you want to sell only to people and entities that are rich enough that they should know how to protect themselves. You don't want to sell to widows and orphans. Preferably don't sell to your grandmother um, who's uh, investing the, her last uh, $100. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for not doing that too, especially Thanksgiving dinner after the company is tanked. Um, but also probably violates the securities laws. Um, so. um, and what does it mean to see people who are um, uh, rich enough to, that they should be able to protect themselves? Well, a million dollars in net worth or $200,000 in, uh, in annual income over the past couple of years. Um. Very good. You're exactly right. This is in flux. These numbers have not changed at all in, uh, I don't know how many years, probably the entire time I've been practicing. Uh, but they did just take your house out of this, so this may these numbers may change. I mean, a million dollars back in the in the uh, 80s was was worth something, you know. Uh, now you know it's just chump change. You know? Yeah. <coughs> if you got any millions extra, you want to give me, uh, it's fine too. Um, and there are some separate rules for employees. We'll ignore those for the for the moment. Um, the other rule I said about disclosure, no material misstatements or omissions, it really comes down to this. Everything you need to know about this one you learned in kindergarten. So tell the truth. Don't lie. Don't make stuff up. Don't trick anybody. Tell the whole story. Tell them what can go wrong. Basically, if you're sitting there thinking, I can't tell them that. If I tell them that, they're not going to invest. Well, the law pretty much says that's exactly what you've got to tell them. That's a great way to test it. You know, if I, if I mention this, is this going to affect his investment decision? No. If you're asking yourselves that, you got to do it. You know, it's not like, um, I, I always want to do a, um, uh, you know, write a skit for, uh, um, about um, what, if we, what if we had to sell other things the way we, we, we have to sell securities? You know, like, like you're selling refrigerators or used cars and all the, having to disclose all of this stuff to people and, and everything. Or what if you, oh, and going on dates, you know, you had to like provide disclosure and risk factors on date. Well, anyway, um, that's another topic. Okay, so what I've got for you in the next 18 slides um, or so um, is really for something for you to flip through at home and look at and see how does the capitalization of a venture-backed company progress over time. Um, so I'm going to go through that, that pretty fast, um, and then we'll get to some, some questions um, at, the, uh, at the end. I want to make sure there's enough time for that. Um, so the stages in the life of a venture-backed company that this goes through, you know, founders getting some initial employees, uh, getting some initial investors. Um, you didn't listen to me. You brought in your grandmother. You brought your friends and family in. They all are sure that they're going to be rich based on your efforts. Um, so you bring in friends and family. You bring in some angels. Uh, you probably set up an option plan at this point. Next stage is bringing in Series A investors, real institutional investors. Uh, might be some larger angels um, or more angels. Might be the VCs. You know, next round, uh, some more VCs. Maybe bring in some strategic investors, some corporations that are in this business and uh, want to uh, uh, invest. Um, usually, there's a third round of uh, venture investment. You know, rather than taking all, if you figure you need to raise 
50 million dollars total for the life of this company. You know, rather than taking it all at once, you take 10 million at the beginning at you know at the low price that you have to. Uh, that, that's the best you can get at the beginning, and then as you build through the milestones, you you, you take the remaining 40 million over time at higher prices, so you're giving up less of the company um, as you go on. Maybe there's even a fourth round. Um, actually, you know, that'd be pretty good if you got through four. Uh, I have a company that, um, since usually the venture, uh, each different round is, is associated with a different series of preferred stock. You get series A, series B, series C. Um, well, I have a company that ended up with 17 series of preferred stock. Now, part of that was some of the dances of uh, if you had, did certain things, you got certain rights, you didn't. But they did have A through I, you know, and then they had A prime through H prime. And then we got rid of all that because they needed more money. And we, st we went back and we started with series one. And then we did series two. And then we got rid of all that. And now we're to, I think we're back to uh, series A1. And we're about to do series A2. So it's been around for about 10 years. You were the one who started the company, actually. So <laughs> many years ago. So it wasn't because of that. It was excellent lawyering all through this. And then hopefully it leads to an IPO. Although getting acquired can be as lucrative and can even be better than, uh, than going public because if you go public, yes, you get uh, all this cachet and you get all these articles written about you and you get to ring the bell in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the New York Stock Exchange and, and they give you a nice breakfast and give you these plaques and medallions and you get your name up on the, on the ticker tape uh, for NASDAQ and all. Um, but that just means that now you have an opportunity maybe to sell your shares over time starting six months after the IPO and hopefully you keep performing as a company so that the stock price stays up. Whereas in an acquisition, especially a cash acquisition, you got the cash right then. That's it. You don't have to build everything that your company is missing. You don't have to build a fully integrated pharmaceutical company. You only have to build the, the, uh, the technology to come up with this drug. You know, somebody else is going to do the distribution, the, the, the sales and marketing, the manufacturing. So. Don't poo-poo doing, you know, getting acquired somewhere along the way. Let's go really quickly on, on some of these slides because I want to get to questions. Here's stage one where the founders come in, and I just sort of arbitrarily picked some names, titles, contributions, and allocations. You know, you have to look among your group yourself and decide, well, what's the worth of each of us? It's a very tough question, but I can't answer it. You know, how should you divide up the initial capital? Um, but here's what the, this company decided among the three founders. You know. As you bring in initial employees, you have a bunch of issues about how do you price the, uh, um, the shares, which gets into complex tax and accounting things. Uh, we talked about vesting and unvesting. So we brought in two more employees here. And you can see, you know, the employees are getting a lot less than the founders. It's just kind of the nature of, uh, of the thing. There is no technical difference between founder stock and common stock or founders and employees. That's just a term of convenience. There's nothing legal there. Initial investors, we're going to bring in uh, some of them. Remember securities laws, you know, the people, the rich people are called accredited investors. Um, often it's done as convertible debt, you know, because it's simple. You don't have to pay me the money to set up preferred stock where you're only raising maybe half a million dollars and you don't have to get into the question of valuation. Instead, you maybe you, you say, uh, we're going to borrow $100,000 or, or from you and you can convert it into um, stock at the time we do the next, the first venture capital round at a discount, maybe 80%. And it's not, yeah, there's debt, but nobody really expects it to, to, to be a real loan for interest to be paid or, you know, if the company tanks, um, it's not like there's going to be anything left there for the, 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 um, the people who are, uh, who are extending the debt to, uh, to get um, 
uh, paid back. Uh, the trade creditors are going to take everything. Um, and you usually set up an option plan. So here's a chart that shows um, how uh, this might be allocated. And I can't assign a, uh, um, a percentage of the fully diluted ownership to the angels because it's dead. It hasn't been converted into stock yet. Um, but there's how the ownership might be divided. Note that a big chunk is taken up by the option plan. And who knows how the angels fit in because we don't know what, their, what price the, their 500000 is going to come in at. We bring in the institutions, the, series, the, the uh, venture capitalists. And like I talked about, the angel debt in the last round, it's going to convert over into common usually. The venture capitalists are also going to want to see a, um, uh, a decent sized option plan. So if you've used up a lot of options, they're going to you know, want to increase the size of it. They're going to take a majority of the board. Maybe they're going to bring in a professional CEO. You've got to be expecting that the VCs may want to bring in their own CEO. You may be tremendous at managing a company. You may be able to manage a company from founding all the way up through public companies. There are people in Silicon Valley who've done that. The vast majority of people cannot. You know, I couldn't be a CEO at all. So, but um, you know, there are people who can be CEOs. You know, fine from founding up to a million dollars. Uh, you know, run rate in a quarter, and, and then others will be up to twenty million dollars and things like that. You need to be sensitive to yourself as to. You know, what are my capabilities? You need to be realistic to it, and you need to think, how am I going to react if the VCs come in and say, I want, uh, or we really need to bring in a professional manager? Sometimes they may be wrong. You know, I mean, the VCs basically have two things when they can, two buttons. We're not taking this, are we? They have two buttons they can push in front of them. You know, one is put in more money. The second is fire the CEO. So if you're the founder and the CEO, you always have to keep in mind. Now, if you can gracefully go into a different role, chairman, CTO, something like that, um, then you may be able to continue participation in the company. Um, but that takes a lot within you. It takes a lot within the relationship with the VCs and the entities. And you've you, you got to be cognizant of this, this uh, risk that it's going to happen. Um, so anyway, um, in case you're interested, here's how long it takes to do a VC financing. About three to six months. Actually, that's pretty, pretty aggressive, you know, six months or more. If you wanted to raise money, uh, well, you couldn't raise money right now. If you wanted to have money by middle of next year, you better start as soon as the um, people are back from the holidays in January. Um, uh, where do I come in as a lawyer? Oh, somewhere about here. This is all you doing all of these things. And then... I give you some ideas here, and then the lawyers really gear up in the last month here. So here's a breakdown of the, of the ownership. And then well, you can see how the pie is completely different. The green of the, the VCs, the angels now are, are brought in here. They've increased the size of the option reserve, the option E's. They also brought in a new CEO. He's going to want 6 to 10%. Founders are getting squeezed down to, what is that? That's about a quarter of the company right there. So you can barely even see the employees. When you bring in the second round, Series B, um, you've got all sorts of issues about how do the, uh, the uh, series relate to each other. Do they want to increase the option plan more? Do they want to add more VCs to the board? Do they want to more, add more senior executives? You know, do they want to add some venture debt and, and some financing that's not equity-based? Here's the big chart. And there's, it's, it's gotten to the point where I, I don't even break out the founders. Now all three founders are all in one, one there. So uh, give me 30 more seconds and then we'll, we'll uh, almost be in. So that's the end of my presentation other than 7.5%. Anyone want to guess what that is? Very good. How much is my idea really worth? Yeah. The VCs, they're going to come in at the first round and say, you know, 
all this math, everything, that, you know, discounted cash flows, all this stuff that comes out to, you know, we think we need to get about 50% of the company. You know, you want to raise $5 million? Uh, I think your pre-money valuation is $5 million. Oh, did you say $7 million? I think your pre-money valuation is 7 You know, it's going to be about in that range, you know. Okay, so maybe, you know, pre-money valuation is 5 and you're raising 7 It's still going to be in the 50% range. They want 20% for the option plan, so that's 70%. That leaves 30% for you as the founders. They want four-year vesting on your shares. They don't want to be able to put money in and have you walk out the door the next day with 30% of the company. Uh, pretty reasonable, it seems like, especially if you put your hat on as, as a manager. If you have two founders and you think, well, how would I feel if my co-founder left the day after the investment? I, you know, I, best thing seems like a pretty good idea. Maybe since you've been working on the idea for a while, um, before you brought in the VC fin in, uh, funding and you, you put in a lot of your own money and a lot of effort, you're not going to get any of that money back, by the way. You know, you know the VCs are not going to have money come back to you out of you know, financing proceeds. But maybe we'll give you credit for the work you've done. One year of upfront vesting. You know. 30% divided by 4 is 7.5. That's how much of the company you get for everything you've done to bring it to the point of bringing in investors. And after that, everything more that you get in the company in terms of percentage and making that 7.5% worth anything is all based on what you do from then on out. So founding a company is not in itself what makes you rich. It's the founding plus everything else. And maybe it's in a CEO role, maybe it's in a CTO role, maybe it's in a chairman role, but it's staying and working with the company through that to make it a success. I think that's it for my presentation. So now we got some questions. So, so you, you, I deferred you first, so. So, so aren't there some of the article discussions? Yes. Yep. Yep. So, so. Okay. So the question is, if you bring in a consultant, um, you know, can you give that person um, um, ISOs? Um, and if not, what do you do? Um, ISOs are only available for real employees. Uh, we'll put a footnote that there are a number of people who are consultants and independent contractors in the Valley who the IRS um, will characterize as employees. Um, people try to get around the, the um, uh, withholding rules and the, uh, the benefit rules and everything. Um, but uh, you grant them non-statutory options, NSOs. You know, they can be granted to, um, uh, to consultants and it works just the same as, as, um, as the ISOs. They just don't get the beneficial tax treatment. And there's no withholding for our true, um, or payroll taxes for a, a true independent contractor. So, uh, somebody had a question, I think, up here earlier that I deferred you. Yeah. Yeah, let me answer the second question first, which was, um, is there, there seems to be a trend of people issuing restricted stock units um, rather than options right now. Um, and yes, I see that mainly uh, as a public company um, issue. Um, part of it is just, it doesn't go with the golf course analogy. You know, say, I got restricted stock units, people are going, what are those? Um, and, and it's more complex than you need at a private company level. Um, um, I will say that at a public company level, restricted stock units um, are probably the best way to go from an accounting and, a, uh, and uh, um, using up the number of shares in your option plan. There are definite benefits there. But even then, most public companies are not doing it. That's a whole different discussion. 
Um, back to the earlier question, uh, which was about 83B elections, and uh, let me just talk about those really quickly, but generally. Um, the tax code says that if you get shares, uh, they come up in the context of restricted stock, not options. Uh, and tax code says if you get shares that are subject to vesting, since you may not be able to have to, um, you may not be able to keep the vesting, uh, keep the shares, sorry, because of the vesting, um, it's not fair to tax you on, on those shares and treat that as your property. So we, the IRS, are going to wait until those shares vest, and you, we know that you're going to keep them, um, and then tax you at that time. Um, now, since the value may have gone up at that time, uh, and what they're going to tax you on is the difference, or is the fair market value of those uh, shares at that time, minus any amount you paid for it, um, that gives money to the IRS and it's a bad thing for you. An example being you bought your restricted stock at 50 cents, a year goes by and, and uh, a quarter of it vests um, at that year end point. The value is now $2. You got $1.50 of, of increased value there. That $1.50 is taxable then. That's what Section 83 says. You can elect to not have that happen by filing an 83B election and saying, I want to be taxed all up front, ignoring the vesting right now. And you generally do that just when it's a time that there is no spread, when the fair market value is the same as what you paid. So you're saying, tax me right now on zero amount of gain there. If you, uh, you, yeah, and you have to file within 30 days. But you wouldn't do it if you were paying uh, 50 cents for stock that was worth a dollar because you'd be saying, well, tax me on that 50%, 50 cents of gain um, right now, um, even though I may not be able to keep it. So they only do it initially, and usually when it's cheap because the, yeah, yeah. So let's go to a different, some other questions? One more question, so. Well, so the question is, you know, when, do, when can you break away from my examples here or the, the situation where the VCs are going to take 50% of your, your um, company at the first round and get to more founder-friendly terms? Um, very rarely. Um, you have to really perform well. Um, and you have to get a number of, of venture capitalists chasing you down. Um, and it has to be a very hot space. And um, uh, and even then, there's going to be some limits on, on what they're going to want to do. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly, but I assume you know when Microsoft finally finally brought in investment, they were able to strike a pretty good bargain. Uh, and I know in the later rounds of uh, of Google, um, you know they uh, you know they had greater bargaining power than than early on, but. They've got quite a track record there already. You know, it's not, it's very hard to walk in and say, well, I have this business plan that's going to be tremendous. And, uh, and uh, just because it's a hot space and I believe I can do this, um, it's, uh, uh, you know, I have the upper hand in negotiations. Um, <clears throat> I mean, so much is execution beyond just idea. Uh, that. So, uh, but if you can get there, I mean, if you can get there, and not even have to raise the money. That's the best. So. Why don't we wrap up? Thanks very much. It's been great to have you. Yeah. Thank you.